We often call Pentecost the birthday of the church. And that's because on that particular day, that moment when there were all of these people gathered in Jerusalem, this miraculous event takes place. And so all of these people begin to hear the proclamation by the apostles of this news about Christ crucified and risen. Up until that time, they've been very afraid. They've been locked away in the upper room for fear of the Jews, as the scripture says in John chapter 20. But Jesus, first of all, comes into their midst and then he breathes on them and says, receive the Holy Spirit. And when this is portrayed in the Acts of the Apostles, as it is in the, the first lesson today, it's now being poured out upon the people who are gathered there. In, in Jesus' time, the 50th day after the Passover, Pentecost, was their celebration of the giving of the law. It originally had been a feast that was agricultural in nature of the ingathering of the first grain that had ripened. But by Jesus' time, it also has taken on this idea of being the celebration of the giving of the law. So here, all of these people were, by faith, required to come to Jerusalem for that celebration. And so people were coming, the Jews who had been dispersed in so many other places, were coming to Jerusalem, and there they were. And as Dave read in the reading, they were from all kinds of places. Places that some that may still exist, but others that, you know, are just names now and maybe little spots on a, on a map in your Bible. But nevertheless, they all hear and they are all amazed. And as the little quip is then made there by some, you know, they're drunk. They're filled with new wine. And then that's when Peter has to let them know. Now, it's only nine o'clock in the morning they haven't had enough time yet to get drunk, if that's what it is. But it's what happened that bring them together. It all of a sudden then united this group of people that they all were hearing the good news, but they were hearing it in their own languages. But it was the same message for all that was meant to bring them into a unity with one another, and by that unity to become fully the body of Christ. So it was the being put together by the gift of the Spirit, thinking of how all of these language groups now are brought together, which is the reversal of what happened at the time in Genesis in the Tower of Babel, when the tower uh, is you know, tumbled down and uh, God confuses all the languages so that the people wouldn't boast anymore and wouldn't try to reach heaven by building the tower or whatever their prideful attitude would have uh, driven them to next. So it's the reversal of that. And it's the continuation of the power of God to change minds and change hearts and change lives because that life-giving breath of God, the wind that in the book of Genesis we read hovered over the waters and then began to bring forth all of the life and the form of the earth and eventually human beings and that God breathes into Adam and into Eve to make them living beings. This is the same breath of God that has continued through all of these centuries to be breathed out upon you and me and all those who 
we've been called from whatever backgrounds we come from, from whatever uh, attitudes we may have had, that we have been called together as God's holy people in this particular place by virtue of our baptism into Christ and the gift of His Holy Spirit that we have been united with one another and through that unity we are united in Christ. We are united in God. We have our really temples of the dwelling place of our God. That's why we should never underestimate the gift that we have received and that gift of the Holy Spirit that has the power to change us, to give us hope, to give us joy, to give us peace, to give us strength, to give us an identity. You know, Paul goes into that in the second lesson. And he says that that spirit that's been given to us enables us to call God our Abba, our Daddy, that we can have this familiarity with God that the Jews could not have because they were bound by the law, bound by this very strict understanding of the total otherness of God, which is not changed in this experience, but that God is made approachable and not only approachable, but able to be spoken to and to speak to us and to not overwhelm us and to not do to us what you know, they were forbidden uh, to, to, uh, to do in the Old Testament because if they got too close, that God would do them in. We can draw close, we can draw near, because of what has been given to us, what has been done to, for us. We have been united in a unique way with God by the Holy Spirit. And that unique binding continues on forever. We cannot lose this identity of ours. We can refuse to acknowledge it. But from God's side, it's not a gift that he will ever take back or away from us. And so that's, I think, one of the principal ideas for us for, for Pentecost is the reminder of, again, who we are and whose we are and what it is that we are charged to do which is to live out this gift in loving service and obedience to God and others. The greatest measure of the presence of the Holy Spirit in the church and in the world is the capacity to love. If we, able, if we are able not only to love those who love us, but if we can love those who don't love us, if we can forgive those who have offended us, if we can respond with civility when we are vilified, when we have to face a variety of things that people may say about us because of our faith or because of who we are or what we believe or where we go to church or whatever it might be, if we can respond to that with compassion and understanding, even though we will disagree, then that would be a sign of the true love that dwells within us that is empowered by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is with us always. The Holy Spirit is with us to inspire, to strengthen, to guide. The Holy Spirit is 
that part of the Holy Trinity, that person of the Holy Trinity, that we may not think about very often, but is very much a part of our Christian life, the one that brings about the effect of the sacraments, that brings about the effect of the Word of God, that brings about the effect of our witness to the world around us. <clears throat> share a couple things uh, in conclusion. This is uh, taken from the book The Go Between God by John V. Taylor. He says, our theology would improve if we thought more of the church being given to the Spirit than of the Spirit being given to the Church. For if we phrase it in the second way, although it is the New Testament way, we are in danger of perpetuating the irreverence or picturing God's Spirit as a giant, as a grant of superhuman power or guidance, like a fairy sword or magic mirror to equip us for all our adventures. The promised power from on high is not of that kind at all. The primary effect of the Pentecostal experience was to fuse the individuals of that company into a fellowship which in the same moment was caught up into the life of the risen Lord. In a new awareness of him and of one another, they burst into praise and the world came running for an explanation. In other words, the gift of the Holy Spirit in the fellowship of the church first enables Christians to be, and only as a consequence of that, sends them to do and to speak. The Holy Spirit is given to enable the two or three gathered together to embody Jesus Christ in the world. So I'm going to suggest that you do this prayer on a daily basis, not just today. It's very simple. Holy Spirit, what do you want of me today? Give me eyes that can see, ears that can hear, and a heart that can love. And now I'd like to... Uh, Pray this prayer of consecration to the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> On my knees before the great multitude of heavenly witnesses, I offer myself, soul and body, to you, eternal Spirit of God. I adore the brightness of your purity, the unerring keenness of your justice, and the might of your love. You are the strength and light of my soul. In you I live and move and am. I desire never to grieve you by unfaithfulness to grace, and I pray with all my heart to be kept from the smallest sin against you. Mercifully guard my every thought and grant that I may always watch for your light and listen to your voice and follow your gracious inspirations. I cling to you and give myself to you and ask you by your compassion to watch over me in my weakness. Holding the pierced feet of Jesus and looking at his five wounds and trusting in his precious blood and adoring his open side and stricken heart, I implore you, adorable spirit, helper of my infirmity, so to keep me in your grace that I may never sin against you. Give me grace, O Holy Spirit, Spirit of the Father and of the Son, to say to you always and everywhere, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. <clears throat> <clears throat>